This video covers everything from dark mode, internationalization, cookies, and so on. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you. And today I'm going to be doing that with five more React hooks. And you definitely want to watch all these, especially the last one on translations, because that hook is incredible. But to get started, we're going to be using the use click outside hook, which is one that's great for things like modals. So first we have our component, our click outside component. We have an open and set open state, and we have a reference to a modal. And then we're calling that use click outside. We're passing it our modal, and we're saying, hey, if our modal is open, we're going to close it whenever we click outside of our modal reference. And down here, we have a button to open our modal, and we have this giant div, which is just a modal. It's just a giant blue rectangle, and this is where our modal ref is put. So as you can see, if we open it, our modal is open. And if we click inside of our modal, nothing happens. But as soon as I click outside the modal, it closes the modal. That's what this use click outside hook does. As you can see, all we're doing is using this use event listener hook that we created in a previous video. I'll link in the cards for you and description down below. We're setting up a click event listener and we're doing it on the document. And this function, all we're doing is we're saying, hey, is our current reference equal to null? Or is our current reference inside of the thing that we clicked on or the thing that we clicked on? If so, just return. Otherwise, call the callback function with the event. So all this does is say, hey, if we clicked inside of this thing, do nothing. Otherwise, if we clicked outside of it, call the callback. And that callback here is just making our modal closed. This is a super simple hook that's great for things like modals, but there's tons of other use cases where you're going to want to use this hook. So it's great to have in your back pocket because it's so much easier just to use one line instead of writing out all this complex code. And the next hook I want to talk about is called use dark mode. And this is a hook that is pretty much in every application that you can think of is going to have a use for this dark mode hook. So if we look at our dark mode component, you can see that we have our use dark mode and you can see it's dark mode and set dark mode. So we can toggle it and we can actually have our dark mode. And then whenever we click on this button, I just want to toggle our dark mode and we just have some styles based on that dark mode variable. So when I click on this, you can see that my web page toggles between light and dark mode. And the best part is, is when I refresh my page, it actually saves whatever my latest thing is. So I left it on dark mode, so it stays dark. If I leave it on light mode, it'll stay on light mode. That's because it's persisted in local storage. So if we go to use dark mode, you can see we're using our local storage hook for dark mode. And we can see that we can set our dark mode. And then what we're doing, this is awesome, is we're using this use media query hook here. And we're saying prefers color scheme dark. So if the browser for the user is set to prefer the dark color scheme, we're going to have preferred dark be set to true. That way, the first time they come to our website, it's going to default them into dark mode or it's going to default them into light mode if they don't prefer dark mode. And down here, all we're doing is we're saying, OK, have they explicitly set light or dark mode yet using this set dark mode function? If so, use that. Otherwise, if they haven't set that yet, we're going to default to whatever their browser settings are. And then every single time that we change dark mode to light mode or light mode to dark mode, we're just going to be taking a class on our body and toggling that dark mode class. And that's because if we want to change our background color of our body, for example, we need to use this class. So as you can see, our background color changes to this dark color in dark mode and in light mode, it's just a default white color. That's what this body CSS does. And that's how we're getting this toggle effect. So the main thing that's happening is first we default to the browser setting that they have set. Otherwise, we default to whatever they specifically set in our application, and we're just toggling that on our body. This is an incredibly powerful hook, and you can really use this for specific themes if you want. So if you want multiple themes, you can have like a use theme hook, which is very similar to this. We're just using dark mode because that's kind of the most common theme you'll see as having a dark and a light mode for a website. And this makes it really easy to swap between your themes and to use your theme only where you need it. Now, the next hook I want to talk about is going to be another really simple hook, but one that you see all over the place, and that's having the functionality to copy to clipboard. All the time when you're on websites, you're going to find a button that's like, hey, copy this secret key to the clipboard or copy this password or copy something to clipboard and that's what this hook does as you can see we call use copy clipboard and this gives us a function called copy to clipboard as well as some information for example success as this was a successful copy or not and then we can call copy to clipboard with the text we want to copy so whenever we click on this button here it's going to copy the text this was copied so right now i'm just going to copy this text called copy text so as you can see when i paste it's pasting copy text if i click this button right here now, when I paste, you can see it paste the text this was copied, which is what's inside of that copy to clipboard function. And you can see that the button is changed to copied, and that's because success is true. So now the text has been changed here to copied. So if we look at the hook, it's actually really straightforward because we're using this copy to clipboard library, which does all of the hard work for us. As you can see, we have a value state and a success state, which we're passing down. So we can see what has been copied and if it was successfully copied. And then here we just have our copy to clipboard function, which is a super simple function. And all this function is doing is taking in a text and it's taking in some options. 
and it's just saying, hey, call the copy function from copy to clipboard with our text and our options. And then this result is true or false. So if the result is true, save the value we copied and then set success to either true or false, depending on if the copy was successful or not. Again, this is something that you're going to see all over the place across different websites and having just a simple hook that you can use like a one liner like this makes this copy functionality so much easier to work with. Now, the next hook I want to talk about is for dealing with cookies. And again, cookies are a real pain to work with, but having a hook to manage them for you just makes it so much easier. Let's open up the code for that real quick. We'll look at our component first. You can see we are using a cookie. This cookie has a name of name and it has a value, a default value of John. As you can see, it's printing out John over here and we have the value an update function and a remove function. So here we have value and we have a function where we click on it. It'll update the name to Sally and we have a button where we click on it. It will delete the name. So if I click change name to Sally, you can see it changed to Sally. And when I refresh, it now is still persisting as Sally because it's saved in our cookies. If I click delete, it's going to remove that cookie. And when I refresh, it'll default to John because that's our default value if there is no cookie at all. So if we look at this use cookie, you're going to see we pass in the name and the default value. And inside of our use state, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, is there a cookie already there? We'll do our cookie to get. And if there is a cookie, we're going to return that. Otherwise, we're going to set a new cookie with that default value and return that default value. And this cookies object comes from a library called JS cookie, which just makes working with cookies easier because doing document.cookies is a huge pain. Now we have our update and our delete functions, which are really straightforward. We pass it in a new value and some options, for example, like an expiration time. And we're just going to set the cookie with the given name to the new value. And we're going to set our value for our, like our internal React state to that new value. And on delete, same thing, we're just removing the cookie with a given name and we're setting the value to null. And then we're just returning all three of those things, the value and the update and delete function. So this is some super straightforward code, very similar to like use local storage or use session storage. And it means that we can now use cookies in our application incredibly easily, which is something that's great when you need to do like authentication or send information to the server through these cookies. Now, the final hook in this video I want to talk about is, in my opinion, the most useful and my favorite hook, and that's the use translation hook. So we're going to first look at the component and then we're going to actually look at the hook itself, because this one's a little bit more complex than some of the stuff we've talked about so far. So let's comment that in place here and we're going to look at the component. As you can see, this component is just a use translation hook. It doesn't take in any information and it returns to us a bunch of information. This actually isn't even quite everything it returns. You can see it returns to us the language that we're translating. You can see we can set the language we want to translate to. We have a fallback language. So let's say that we don't have a translation for that word. It'll fall back to the fallback language. And then we have T and this is a function we can call whatever we want, but T is kind of a standard name for it. And that allows us to translate something from a name into an actual real world text. And down here, we're printing out the language, a bunch of different translations, and then we can change our language to Spanish or English with these buttons down here. So if we go and we look at our use translation hook, we can kind of see what's going on behind the scenes. You can see we're storing the current language and we're also storing our fallback language in local storage and we're just defaulting them to English for now. You can change that to whatever you want, but we're just going to default to English by default. Then we have a translate function. And this translate function is going to take in our key. And since our key can be a nested key, we want to be able to split on the dot and we want to get the nested translation. So for example, here nested.value is going to be a nested object we want to translate out. And inside of here, we're just getting the values for those different languages. And we're saying, hey, do we have a value for our language? If not, give us the value for the fallback language. And if we don't have any fallback language, just give us the key as the absolute worst case scenario. And then we return all this information down here. So the way this works is we have this translations folder. And as you can see, we're importing all of our translations up here into this translations variable. That's importing from our index.js file here. And here we have an export called en, which handles all of our English translations. And we have one sp, which handles all of our Spanish translations. And these names en and sp are the exact same names here we're setting for our language, sp and en. That's really important. Then inside of our translations, you can see we're translating the text hi to hello. The key by goes to goodbye. And we have this nested value, which is a nested JSON object, translates to test. So now if I go to my component, you can see hi prints out hello. I prints out goodbye, and this nested value is printing out test, just like we expect. Now, if we go to Spanish, for example, you can see we only have a translation for hi. So when I change to Spanish, you can see that hello up here has translated to hola, but goodbye and test don't have a Spanish translation, so it's using the fallback language, which in our case is English. As you can see, instead of our use translation, our fallback language here is English. Now, if we wanted to change our fallback language, we can just come in here, we can say set fallback language, and let's say we want to set our fallback language to Spanish and we're going to say change fallback lang. There we go. So now if I change our fallback language to Spanish, you're going to see that now this says by and nested value 
And that's because inside of use translate here, we don't have a translation for Spanish and our fallback language is also Spanish. We don't have a translation for it. So it's just printing out the key. And that key here is by or it's nested dot value. So this is a super easy way to do translations. All you need to do is add your translations to these JSON files here. And those translations are automatically gonna be picked up by your application and anywhere you want to use them, you can just put in this use translation hook. It's super useful in my opinion. And this hook alone is one of the best hooks you can add to any application that's going to scale globally. Now, if you enjoyed this video, you're going to love the four other videos I've done on this topic. I'll link them over here and down in the description below. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.